Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Meredith. Um, I'm the executive director for a nonprofit organization called Universities Allied for Essential Medicines that um, was began actually at Yale Law School um, in conjunction with uh, Yokai, who's here, who also we have the privilege of his sitting on our advisory board. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a couple of uh, case studies um, about how patents influence access to medicines and um, some examples of what we can do potentially um, if we are willing to think outside the box a little bit, I hope. Um, so some of you may have heard of this example, uh, Extandi. This is a prostate cancer drug uh, that was developed at UCLA with uh, publicly funded grants, uh, from mostly from the NIH and the Department of Defense. Um, and actually, interestingly, um, the University of California system does have some sort of global access licensing provisions that UAM had pushed for and campaigned for in previous years. So going back to our discussion about you know, having something on your website and having a policy, but whether or not a university implements it, the implementation piece is going to be really key. And what we've seen here is a drug that was developed with US taxpayer money. It now has a price tag in the United States for $129,000 um, for one annual you know, year of treatment, basically. The same drug um, in Canada is being sold for 29000 and there is um, a quote from a third-party supplier that they can make these drugs for around $3. Um, so we obviously recognize, and part of the mission of UAM is, is really recognizing the role of universities to be leaders, and obviously students within those universities um, to solve some of the access to medicine crisis that we have today, uh, and the 10 million people who don't have access to the life-saving drugs that they need, uh, who die annually as a result. So this is sort of an example of what could happen, even if you do have these nice policies, if they're not adhered to. Um, this is the sort of thing that we're going to be looking at. And typically, for us, we have looked at ensuring access provisions in lower middle income countries. But as we were talking about, as we were talking this morning, this sort of a uh, problem has come home to roost here in the United States and in Europe um, where we're seeing exorbitant um, prices for life-saving drugs which are often publicly funded in the first place. And this goes back to sort of the, the story that, um, that started UAEM back in 2001 at the, heights of the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. Um, Doctors Without Borders or MSF we're looking to treat people with, living with HIV for the first time in history. And one of the drugs that they were looking at was Storvadine D4T. And um, they realized that it had been discovered by this chap here, um, Professor Prusoff at Yale University. Um, and students basically uh, went to their administration and said, this is unacceptable that it's being Price at $10,000 a year, which actually, ironically, in today's terms, doesn't seem as much, unfortunately, um, and campaign that they needed the university to change the license with Bristol Myers Squibb. Um, at the time, initially, Yale said, no, this is not possible. But as we know, even with patent law, this isn't a law of nature, and these things can be changed. And eventually, after some bad press in the New York Times, um, in, a few, in a few weeks, believe it or not, Yale agreed to um, change the license with Bristol Myers Squibb. And it allowed for generic importation of the drug into South Africa. And MSF were able to treat people living with HIV for the first time. And that wouldn't have happened um, without the pressure of law students at Yale and sort of civil society, there were some other actors as well. But more broadly, there is, with this quote, I think, as well, from Dr. Prusoff, it shows that you know, people are not necessarily all going into science because they want to make a lot of money. Um, and not knowing, potentially, in this case, um, that his invention, his discovery, had not, in fact, gone to treat the people he had hoped he would treat. Um, yes, and then this came out, this was 2005, it's a little old now, but um, 
out of the horse's mouth, Yale didn't actually lose any money in the process. Um, this is a more recent case uh, with Johns Hopkins. Uh, Sutezolid, um, an antibiotic, um, and it looks like it will be a promising treatment for MDRTB. It was going to be licensed to Sequela, Ali mentioned it earlier, um, which is a small biotech that didn't really have the capacity to, to really bring it quickly enough to, uh, to market potentially or to be able to do sort of um, a combination uh, trials. Um, so UA UAM, again, in, in conjunction with MSF and a TB uh, group called TAG, uh, worked in conjunction with JHU students and alumni to basically persuade the administration to not license to this group and to license uh, to another uh, organization, the Medicines Patent Pool, um, that would protect access and affordability. And interestingly, all the licenses for the MPP are available on their website. You can take a look at them, uh, and they, they're, they're doing just fine. Um, so yeah, so this happened. This happened over a period of two years. Um, and and uh, Johns Hopkins became the first university, American university, to license to the MPP when they opened up their mandate to include TB last year. And this was finally signed in January. And then already TB Alliance is sub-licensing from, um, from the MPP. Uh, and it, it seems to be a, a, a potential win-win for access and affordability. And Johns Hopkins has come out uh, with some good press as a result. Um, so uh, in terms of what we do, um, and this has been, you know, UAM has been around for at least 10 years, uh, urging tra uh, tech transfer offices to adopt uh, policies around this global access licensing framework, uh, which Yokai um, knows a lot about. And um, we've been urging uh, universities to adopt what we mentioned earlier, the uh, SPS, uh, which Harvard helped launch um, back in 2009. I think most of you, uh, judging by our discussion today, know a lot about global access licensing, but this is a very quick overview um, in a nutshell. Um, but basically, um, yeah, I think it's self-explanatory, just for the interest of time. Um, and I mentioned earlier today, um, the university report card tool. And the idea was when we realized that we were measuring, uh, sort of we were talking to te uh, tech transfer offices and they said, yes, we're doing all these great things. Uh, we're licensing in a particular way. Um, we wanted to make sure that this was actually happening. So this, is a, this report comes out every two years. We should have another one uh, in the US, hopefully by the end of the year. It's been replicated in, um, in Canada, uh, in the UK, and Germany. Um, and as you can see here, Harvard come, has got a B. I don't know if that's good for Harvard or not. But, um, uh, but uh, the idea is we ask a lot of questions. We, uh, we, talk, we, we engage with the university's uh, tech transfer offices to report, self-report a lot of information. And also, a lot of that information is available online as well. Um, but the idea is to urge universities to actually implement uh, the reforms that they're um, suggesting that they are um, adhering to. Uh, and then sort of beyond this, we've been working, obviously, the last 10 years, working with lots of different universities, urging them to, uh, to think about access and affordability of life-saving drugs in low- and middle-income countries. But like I mentioned at the beginning, We've seen these challenges now in Europe, in the United States, where drugs are $84,000, over $100,000. Um, and people are unable, obviously, to afford um, even a medication that is nearly 100 years old. Insulin has been around since 1922. The original patent was given to the University of Toronto. And yet, 100 years later, uh, you've seen the press. The, the prices of insulin are going up and up and up. And it is not uh, by chance. Um, so what can we do? Rather than go university by university, what we would like to do and what we're campaigning around now, and I'd love to hear your thoughts, um, is to target more strategically the funder um, directly. So the NIH, uh, given that they give $31 billion every year to universities, um, 
we would like to ask them to strengthen the conditions they attach to university grants to ensure that um, access and affordability of life-saving medications technologies um, are, are prioritized and that you, you know, Americans here in the United States can afford the drugs that they paid for with their taxpayer dollars. It's not really a radical idea, yet somehow uh, it seems to be. Um, so this is, this is what we're, we're pushing for. Um, ironically, it doesn't even require a change in the law. This is within the NIH mandate, um, yet uh, there have been requests to directly to the director, um, Francis Collins, um, but he hasn't seemed to recognize affordability as something that is his problem. So we are going to be organizing to remind him that it might be actually his problem. Um, and so just to sort of give a broader context here, um, I'm sure many of you know this, but um, last year one in five Americans couldn't afford to fill um, their prescriptions. And I think part of the reason we're talking about patents, certainly in biomedicine, what we're really talking about is people and people's lives. It's very different to patenting some other sort of technology. And I think that's where um, we do need to recognize an important line. And the fact that now, today, more than 70% of Americans believe that drug costs are unreasonable. And amazingly, um, there's a huge, um, there's huge support, according to polls, if you believe polls today, um, for uh, government intervention around um, uh, price controls or of, of drugs. And uh, you know, universities will continue to be at the forefront of that. So um, those are sort of the, the key messages, at least for the few minutes that I've had uh, your attention. Um, but I do, and what we do believe in is really that universities should and must be the leaders of ensuring um, access to and affordability of publicly funded medications here in the United States and around the world, especially given that the $31 billion, even, it is, even if it is cut, uh, will still um, represent the biggest public funder of global health research in the world. Uh, and I think there are reforms that don't require um, more than support from a handful of universities to be able to get them uh, pushed through. So that's it. Thank you.